All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, on behalf of Kirka, thank you all um, for attending this session where we have two great presenters that will um, talk about findings from Dr. Best um, asthma study. So um, if you can please hold your questions until the end. We are recording this session, so it will be housed on the website later. It's not being live streamed right away. Um, and we'll do a little change in the middle as well um, to change the presenters and the slides so you can um, feel free to ask some questions there as well. Um, but it's my great honor to um, introdu introduce Dr. Lyle Best, who's from North Dakota and began his professional career with the Indian Health Service in 1977 as the clinical director of the local hospital and later as the maternal child health consultant for Aberdeen Area IHS, where he was responsible for nine hospitals and 10 clinics in the region. He has served on the IHS IRB in the Aberdeen area since 1989, so he has um, considerable um, experience with a, with a lot of aspects of research in the region. He's conducted genetics research in American Indian communities on the Northern Plains um, for over 30 years and the principal investigator of um, one of the largest studies, um, the Strong Heart Study, um, since 2000. He's um, the PI of the Genetics and Preeclampsia Study at Turtle Mountain Community College and in 2004 and will serve um, through the PI through 2019. He has um, a great educator as well, which is one of the aims within this project, um, which is awesome to give back to our students. Um, he'll be teaching some of our students right over there in a couple of weeks. So always sharing his knowledge um, is such a wonderful gift. He's taught the Intro to Human Genetics course um, from 1997 to 2012 at Turtle Mountain Community College. And most recently, he's directed a randomized control trial um, on this study to improve um, asthma education on the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. So if you please will um, join me in welcoming Dr. Lyle Best. Well, thank you very much, uh, Danelle. Thank you. Um, I guess I uh, misread the, um, the, uh, the schedule a little bit earlier, so I'm probably only going to talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, you might have a little earlier recess today, or maybe there'll be lots of questions, and that'll that'll soak up the whole hour. But at any rate, um, it is a pleasure to uh, to uh, share with you some of our, our um, results today. And I'll start out um, with, uh, since not all of you maybe uh, have a background in medicine, uh, just a little bit about asthma. I think we all understand it involves difficulty with breathing, but what exactly is uh, going on with asthma? And, uh, there's two basic processes. One is that uh, you have bronchospasm, which is sort of like a Charlie horse in your bronchial tubes, where the little muscles around your bronchial tubes go into spasm and they, they shut down or they greatly decrease the, the caliber of, of, um, of your bronchial tube, make it harder to get air in and out. And when I was in medical school, this was pretty much the, the main concept of how asthma worked. And so we mainly focused on things that would relax the, the musculature around the bronchial tubes. In the last 10 or 15 years especially, there's been a lot more emphasis on the inflammatory aspect of, of asthma. So in addition to the muscles squeezing down on the bronchial tubes, you have um, in inflammation which is causing excess mucus production in the, the lumen, the inside of the, the bronchial tube, and also swelling of those, those lining tissues. And so, Again, the inside area that allows the air to go back and forth becomes less and less and makes the breathing that much harder. <coughs> and the uh, treatment for the uh, bronchospasm is pri primarily these days, um, things are analogous to adrenaline or epinephrine basically, which um, help to relax that bronchial musculature. Uh, and for the inflammation, we primarily use inhaled uh, corticosteroids, um, things like Flovent and so on, which um, over time, over hours and days and weeks, will gradually decrease the amount of inflammation. And uh, occasionally we use antihistamines as well and some other medications, but that's primarily the two major focuses is on the bronchospasm and the inflammation. So it appears that uh, there is some evidence, I wouldn't say it's a lot of high quality evidence, but there is some evidence American Indian populations have a higher prevalence of asthma than, than the, uh, the non-Indian population. And <coughs> the 
underlying etiology of asthma is, remains unknown. It's probably another one of those conditions that's it's not really one condition, it's probably five, six, seven different things and slightly different varieties in different people and perhaps even more than one variety in the same individual. So it makes it difficult sometimes to, to do research on it because the, the group of people that you say have this is not really one group, it's, it's a combination of, of uh, groups with different, different causes and etiology. And we already talked a little bit about the treatment relying on bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory agents. There is another category, uh, mast cells release uh, histamine in, um, in human physiology, and so there's uh, another group of um, uh, medications, chromalin in particular, which somehow seem to stabilize the mast cells so they don't release so much um, histamine. In, in some cases where there's a clear allergic component to some specific allergen, whether it's um, uh, cat dander or something like that, uh, an allergist uh, can sometimes use uh, desensitization treatments with repeated injections to, uh, to kind of calm the allergic response and improve asthma control in that way, but this is a relatively small fraction of uh, individuals with asthma. So what we decided to do in, in our study was to do um, really two different studies at the same time. One was a case control study uh, where we, we identified a certain number of children with asthma uh, ages between 6 and 17 and uh, we matched them with two other uh, children around the same age with, uh, without asthma. And uh, the idea was to do a number of tests on the various factors we thought may um, influence and impinge on, on asthma and uh, things such as the environment that they were in in terms of uh, the air quality in the home and, and outside for that matter. Um, we wanted to look at blood tests in particular which would help us understand what this inflammatory component might be in the actual physiology of the individuals uh, with asthma. And then we also wanted to collect the uh, DNA so that we could look at potential genetic modifiers for asthma, things that might either reduce the risk or increase the risk of asthma or perhaps change the difficulty for health control. So those are the basic uh, uh, premises that we wanted to do. Um, in addition, before I, I go on to the next slide actually, there was a second study that was integrated into that and that had to do with uh, possibly improving the control of asthma using an intensive educational program and I'll go into a little more detail on that. But it's kind of an unusual situation where you have two different uh, research methodologies that are basically uh, integrated into one, one uh, overall study. So our case definition was um, we use the Electronic Medical Record System, the Indian Health Service. And this is one of the great um, uh, unappreciated uh, resources uh, of Indian uh, communities. And there's a lot, uh, a lot to be um, criticized in Indian Health Service. I've worked with them for over 20 years, uh, but I think there's also a great deal of strength in what they do. They're very good at preventive health care, as opposed to uh, many of the um, providers in the, in the private sector. Uh, they don't have as much uh, resources as they really need to do the job. But um, besides those various um, overall aspects, one of the things that they have developed over the years <coughs> in cooperation with the Veterans Association was an excellent uh, electronic medical record system that predated most of what you saw, uh, you see now in the, in the private sector. And uh, we use this electronic medical record system at uh, Eagle Butte to uh, identify those individuals with asthma and to obtain uh, contact information so we could go out to uh, contact them. This allows us to use a population-based approach, uh, whereas if you're doing advertising and so on, you, you become biased in the individuals that you bring into your study because these are the people who are, you know, they're reading the newspaper, they're active, they have various other characteristics that give you a, a biased uh, uh, selection. Community. So we use this to give us an unbiased population-based uh, ascertainment of those with, um, with asthma. And then we, we also selected um, uh, controls in the same way from individuals who were born uh, within the same age range. Our case definition uh, applied one of three, uh, two of three criteria. They had to have a diagnosis of asthma by their provider on at least two occasions. Um, and they had to have 
of uh, refills of uh, bronchospastic uh, agents or other asthma medication on at least two occasions in the last two years. Uh, the third criteria involved pulmonary function testing, and uh, they needed to show an improvement of at least 20% of what we call uh, FEV1, which is a measure of how easily you're able to expire your, uh, your air. And unfortunately, uh, most of the children in, at uh, Eagle View did not have uh, pulmonary function testing. It's not necessarily a critical element in caring for children with asthma, but it's fairly frequently done. Most of them did not have that. So in practice, the, the two criteria that, that uh, most of the children um, had and, and qualified them as cases where the, the diagnostic, um, uh, the diagnosis and the refills. Uh, as in terms of exclusionary criteria, we did not uh, include children that had a significant prematurity uh, that had been on ventilators for prolonged periods of time during the neonatal period and so on, or had serious uh, congenital heart malformations or dis disability. Um, <coughs> and then the controls were simply those individuals who could not meet criteria as cases. So in terms of environmental uh, uh, tests that we did, there is a, a theory of, of asthma that, um, uh, you know, I think uh, common sense would tell you if you have a very polluted uh, air environment that could easily aggravate your lungs if there are lots of allergens around and so on, but kind of counterintuitively there's another school of thought that particularly in, in our modern society uh, we've over hygienized ourselves to the point where the, there's really not been enough exposure, especially at a young age, to allergens, and so therefore we develop kind of a hypersensitive response when we come into contact with certain allergens. And um, so perhaps that might be also a, a, a cause for uh, aller um, asthma. So we, at any rate, we wanted to test the, uh, the home environment in particular, looking at uh, dust levels, uh, animal dander levels, um, and some of uh, places where uh, lots of cockroaches and, and, uh, and poor housing standards this can be a, a factor, uh, pollen, carbon monoxide, and smoke in the home and so on. So we, we looked at, at many of these uh, areas. Um, in terms of the, the physiology, we um, uh, did blood samples as I mentioned and uh, one of the main um, measures was what we call uh, serum uh, or uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a protein that your liver makes, which is uh, really kind of the first, uh, one of the first lines of defense against infection or inflammation of any kind. So if you go to the emergency room and you have a sore stomach, your doctor may uh, draw a C-reactive protein level to see if there might be an indication of appendicitis developing and so on. But it's also uh, thought to be uh, likely to be increased in, uh, in asthma and other kinds of problems with lots of inflammation. Uh, secondly, we looked at um, a specific antibody called IgE, which is one of about five or six different categories of antibody that we all have, and seems to be more uh, specifically related to the kinds of antigens that give us problems with allergic problems, whether it's hay fever and things like that, and, uh, and asthma. Uh, in addition to the general category of IgE antibodies, uh, you can also specifically look at more uh, at antibodies that are particular allergens such as cat dander versus dog dander or uh, uh, mold and so on. And so we looked at five specific uh, IgE antibodies as well. Um, we also did a complete blood count uh, looking at the different cell types and the total level of uh, white cells which can indicate inflammation as well. And then in terms of the genetic study, we um, have been using what's called a TACMAN assay which allows us to look at uh, specific, very small changes, just a single nucleotide in the DNA that we carry. Uh, one individual will have an A at this site, rather another individual will have a C and so on. These are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And uh, we can do this uh, testing with uh, these TACMAN assays in relatively inexpensive equipment, which we use at the Turtle Mountain Community College to do these assays. Our statistical analysis is fairly straightforward. We used uh, student t-tests for independent means, uh, comparing the two groups of controls and cases, uh, chi-squared analysis for uh, discrete variables, and then logistic regression to allow us to uh, 
adjust for covariance um, in terms of um, asthma risk. So these are some of the responses to, or some of the results here. Um, you see we had uh, 108 uh, cases and 216 controls. They're equally divided um, by a percent of males in either uh, category and very close in terms of, uh, of age as well. The, um, the total uh, white cell count in the blood samples was slightly higher in the cases and this was statistically significant. And um, <coughs> this would normally show a slight increase in the level of inflammation in, in the body. We then looked at a breakdown of the various uh, uh, percentages of the different uh, white cells, uh, PMNs, lymphocytes, basophils, and eosinophils. And the only difference we could see in the, in the proportion of these cells was in the uh, cases there was a, a higher level of eosinophils compared to the controls, and this was statistically significant again. Um, the eosinophils are known to be increased in individuals that are having uh, allergies or allergic sensitization, so this was not a, not a surprise either. Uh, the, the CRP levels were not statistically significantly different between the two groups, but the total IgE, that antibody involved in, in allergic processes, uh, was, and it was quite a bit higher, uh, sorry, quite a bit higher in the cases compared to the controls. And again, very uh, significant in its uh, statistical measure. So this is just uh, graphically showing the difference between the CRP levels, which there was a, a slightly increased uh, mean for the uh, cases compared to the controls, but uh, this is the IgE, the total IgE level, uh, showing a, a definite difference between the two groups there. And the sensitivity to the specific individual allergens, uh, the mold, the dog and cat dander, mite, cockroach allergens, was greater among the cases compared to the controls as well. And uh, we'll see that in uh, another slide as well. This is the uh, white blood cell count, again showing the difference between cases and controls as well as eosinophils. These are the specific uh, allergens as measured. Uh, the reactivity is measured by the specific IgE, and uh, you see that um, for all of the various categories, there was considerably higher sensitization seen amongst the cases compared to the controls. If you looked at, you counted up the number of antigens that uh, the individuals were were sensitized to, uh, if there were zero antigens that they were sensitized to, then of course the controls showed uh, there were more controls in that category, it was about equal at, at one, but when you started looking at two, three, and four antigens uh, being sensitized to, it was much more common amongst the cases than the controls. So um, a little bit of discussion about these. Uh, increased uh, total IgE levels have been seen before in both associated with atopy, which is um, when Children have um, eczema, for example, and they're one, two years of age. That's an example of atopic atopy. It's a form of allergic process, although we usually never find out what the child is allergic to. Um, and these children are often uh, have problems with asthma and bronchial spasm as well. Uh, so our increased IgE levels have been seen in other in other studies. Um, there's also been a fair amount of uh, genetic work looking at. Uh, IgE expression, and there is uh, both genetic linkage and genome-wide association studies that have found areas of the chromosomes that uh, do affect IgE expression, and this is a, a further uh, analysis that we can do in the data that we have. Uh, in addition, anti-IgE antibodies have been actually used in treatment and shown some effectiveness in treating, uh, treating asthma. Uh, the neutrophils are the white blood cells in your, uh, in your blood, or PMNs, uh, lymphocytes, and so on, uh, have been known to be increased in children with asthma in both uh, the blood or the serum and if you can uh, uh, do bronchoscopy and remove some of the bronchial fluid, you all see the same thing, and this has been reported. And there are some even suggested there's a subtype of asthma called uh, neutrophilic asthma, where you see much higher uh, levels of uh, neutrophils as well. The eosinophils, as I mentioned, are often increased in many individuals that have problems with allergy, asthma, and so on, and may 
maybe another subtype of asthma, asthmatic asthma, that's been reported in a couple of uh, publications as well. Um, the use of biomarkers would be one way of um, perhaps getting around some of the problems we have with defining cases. So uh, if you were interested in looking at, for example, the genetics of asthma, it might be easier and in some ways more effective to look at certain uh, biomarkers that are typically associated with asthma and not necessarily depend on a clinical diagnosis. So these are some of the mark biomarkers that have been recommended in a uh, <coughs> review paper about asthma. Um, they did suggest multi-allergen screening, such as what we did with the, uh, the five different antigens I, I mentioned. I suggested using the complete blood count, the eosinophil count, which we did, and the IgE, both total and allergen specific. Um, they felt in this particular review article that there was not enough evidence uh, that certain genes were uh, clearly associated with antigen, that, that they were useful yet, genetic testing was not useful yet in, in a clinical sense. Uh, and they have seen that uh, increased levels and increasing number of, uh, of IgE-specific, allergen-specific antigens uh, has been associated also with wheezing in children. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's been some thought that, uh, well, perhaps if you're exposed to a lot of different allergens as a child, then you're more likely to become sensitized to it. And I know when my children were growing up, our pediatrician would say, uh, you know, don't don't give them any this or that or so and so until they get to be a certain age and so on. And you've heard probably that there's been a fair amount of attention on uh, peanut allergies, and uh, some places are uh, you know peanut free zones and whatnot. You can't bring peanuts in the airplane in certain situations. I think we're getting away from that again now. But um, peanut allergy can be a very serious uh, condition, and uh, as a result. Uh, the kind of common wisdom at one point was to kind of avoid uh, uh, exposing children to peanuts. Now, peanuts have two problems. One is if, you, if your child inhales a peanut into one of their bronchial tubes or into their larynx, so they'll uh, die very shortly of asphyxia. That's a whole other matter. It can be other things, too, besides peanuts. But the, the kind of peanut allergy where your, your lungs react to it and your bronchial tubes constrict, that's, that's a different matter. So at any rate, they, it was rather unusual, but they just reported a few months ago in February a uh, randomized controlled trial of um, peanut exposure for children. And what started this was uh, in England and many other Western countries, uh, they've been uh, decreasing the exposure of uh, children to peanuts uh, at an early age because of these concerns, whereas in Israel, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why they were encouraging peanut exposure for children. And so that gave them the idea, but they actually randomized uh, a group of children that were uh, more likely to develop um, peanut allergy, and they showed that, that early peanut exposure makes it less likely for them to develop uh, severe peanut allergies as uh, later on in life. So uh, I thought this was rather interesting, and it, it does sort of speak to the, the hygiene theory we talked about earlier, too, where it may not be a good idea just to uh, try and keep our, our children in some sort of bubble wrap until they get to be a certain age, because it, uh, it may be counterproductive. In terms of, uh, of genetics, the, um, as in uh, earlier genetic studies, uh, the simplest thing to do was to see whether there's any relation between the likelihood of developing a condition and the, uh, the strength of relationship between uh, siblings, for example, or other more distantly rela related individuals. So we know that, for example, if you, um, if you have a sibling who is a dizygotic twin, not an identical twin, but dizygotic, uh, you have about a threefold um, risk, increased risk of asthma if your twin has asthma. If your twin is a monozygotic twin, identical, instead of uh, merely dizygotic, your risk goes up to about sixfold. So we can see from that that uh, the, the genes that you're inheriting from your parents uh, do have a, uh, an influence on your risk of asthma, uh, just in, in general. And since that time, more sophisticated studies uh, using linkage analysis, for example, 
uh, have shown that there's a region in uh, chromosome 17, uh, the long Q arm and uh, region 21, uh, that are definitely associated with, um, with asthma. And that was the first uh, place that we went in choosing the, the SNPs, the genetic changes that we were looking at, uh, to see if these would hold in American Indian populations as well. There is a large multi-ethnic uh, consortium uh, looking at asthma. Uh, it's multi-ethnic, but it did not include American Indians. And they, they did show, they confirmed that the 17Q21 region uh, does contain um, uh, variants that increase the risk of asthma, as well as uh, three or four other regions and other, and other chromosomes. Uh, they also, in this consortium, found a unique variant of this particular gene in African Americans that was associated with asthma. So this tells us that in general there may be certain population groups that have uh, specific variants in their genetic makeup that make them more likely or less likely in some cases to have certain conditions. And in our case, we, um, we've we had uh, cases and controls as mentioned. We've only genotyped about half of the individuals so far, however. Uh, but we did pick three SNPs from this 17Q21 region. Um, two of them involve a gene called GSDMB, uh, one of which is in an intronic area, which does not change the coding of the, of the protein that's produced. The other one does change the, the coding, um, changes one amino acid to the other, and thus changes the structure of the protein. And this particular gene ha has some uh, effect on the regulation of something called apoptosis, which is a, kind of the programmed cell death of uh, cells, which is a normal part of our, our, uh, our physiology. And this is effective in the epithelial cells, the ones that would be lining the bronchial tubes. How exactly that relates to asthma is not very clear. Uh, the third gene in the same 17Q21 region is this one here, which involves sphingolipid uh, uh, biosynthesis, with sphingolipids are a fatty substance that are in our, our membranes. And uh, this is also involved in a, a calcium signaling, and I'll mention in a minute some uh, rather exciting recent uh, um, findings about calcium signaling as it relates to asthma. So just in general, our case control um, statistics, I guess we did go through some of these earlier. Uh, the age is uh, essentially the same between the two, uh, and uh, this uh, this is a bit off. We certainly mm -hmm. don't have people of this age. <laughs> I don't know where this. I must have uh, mixed up some numbers with a previous uh, study. At any rate, um, we did see a difference in BMI, and I'm not completely sure if these are the right uh, numbers here or not. I mean, have this in another slide. But we did uh, look at the uh, frequency of the different alleles for these three SNPs, and we did not see a difference between cases and controls in, uh, in these three SNPs. And I do know these are, these are dependable numbers here. Uh, we also used um, a, a chi-square analysis to evaluate different uh, genetic models. So um, <coughs> if you remember your genetics uh, in some cases, you need to have uh, two different, um, the same allele that's inherited from both your parents in order to cause trouble. In other cases, simply inheriting one in a dominant fashion is adequate. So we, we looked at different models of how these uh, SNPs may be affecting your risk of um, preeclampsia, or asthma, preeclampsia asthma. And uh, it could be either additive, where it's one, two, three, or it could be dominant or recessive. And we did not see any uh, significance in this uh, evaluation of these models. This is a chi-square analysis. It is fairly conservative, however. And as I mentioned, we've just started to uh, do our genotyping. We're only about halfway through. Um, here, we used uh, uh, logistic regression in a univariate fashion. We did show that uh, the BMI, the incre for every unit increased in BMI, we saw about a 4% increase in the risk of asthma for those uh, children, and that was significant at, at the 0 0.03 level. Uh, for each of the individual SNPs that we looked at uh, all by themselves in these different uh, models, uh, the only one that showed some uh, promise was this one here, and was not quite uh, 
and meeting the criteria for significance. However, when we uh, put these three SNPs in with the, uh, the three demographic variables in a multivariate analysis, uh, this particular SNP here did show significance, or at least borderline significance. Uh, and I expect when we have uh, the rest of the uh, cases and controls uh, genotype, these will probably um, turn out to be uh, statistically significant as well. And these are uh, SNPs that have been shown to uh, influence uh, asthma risk in other populations as well. So in terms of uh, our finding in, uh, that uh, BMI increases the risk of asthma, this is seen in other, in other studies. It's not really clear why this happens, whether it's perhaps you could think simplistically if you're overweight that you're, uh, you have a decreased thoracic lung volume and, and perhaps reduced airway pressure or airway diameter. Uh, there is evidence that obesity increases your general chronic uh, systemic level of inflammation. <coughs> uh, it could be that there's some common etiologies, maybe there's genetic or environmental factors that increase both uh, obesity and asthma, and the two are, are correlated in that way. Uh, there are different um, adipokinins and uh, cytokinins, which uh, uh, Joe Yershetta will probably be talking a little bit more about, uh, that could be in involved as well. And uh, there's a nice uh, review article here about obesity and asthma and possible mechanisms. Uh, there has been a, a previous study in, in American Indians from the Blackfeet tribe in, in western Montana that did uh, show a similar association between asthma and obesity. Oops. So uh, our results are obviously uh, preliminary. We only have about half of our uh, precipitate participants genotype. Uh, as I mentioned, chi-square analyses tend to be conservative, but we are showing some borderline significance for two of our SNPs. And, uh, the, all of the SNPs basically are showing trends in the same direction, so that the risk alleles in other studies are showing increased risk in our study as well. This is uh, recently um, uh, released in April of 2015. Uh, some exciting news that there's a calcium channel or a calcium sensing receptor gene, um, and the calcium s uh, sensing receptor is affected by certain medications that are used to treat osteoporosis. And uh, these folks in England um, showed that um, the uh, effect of this medication on, uh, on uh, airways and on uh, asthma is, is quite dramatic. And it may actually be one of the chief factors involved in uh, creating both the bronchospasm and the inflammatory component of asthma. So there's been a lot of excitement about this. Uh, partly because these medications are already available for other treatments, and uh, that would mean that they don't have to go through quite so much uh, <coughs> uh, further testing before they could be tested uh, clinically. Just to acknowledge uh, some folks, um, Dr. Jim Wallace is a pulmonologist at Sanford, and Ray O'Leary is a respiratory therapist, and the two of them worked uh, earlier on a uh, breathe program, which was uh, designed to uh, increase um, the educational component of, of asthma control. And that's really where the, the initial uh, impetus for the, the uh, study came from. Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle is a pediatrician in Bismarck and from uh, uh, Oglala Sioux Tribe originally. And uh, unfortunately, she is uh, kind of indicated she's not really feel she has enough time to, uh, to work on the study currently with us in terms of um, writing and analysis at this point. So uh, she was involved earlier in helping us uh, set up some of our, our questionnaires. Uh, Joe Yershetta, who you'll hear from in a moment or two, um, has been working with us on <coughs> testing the environmental um, uh, measures. And Kendra Enright and Terry Lynn Halfred are both from uh, Cheyenne River and really did uh, the bulk of the bomb almost all of the groundwork, uh, field work, collecting the samples and uh, recruiting and, and enrolling individuals. Of course, I want to thank the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, the Health Department, uh, Turtle Mountain Community College, where the genetic analysis is uh, underway, and the Indian Health Service at Eagle Butte uh, for access to their electronic medical record system, and uh, of course, the grant from uh, Kirka. I think that's the end of it. And, uh, I guess we'll uh, take questions later. Right?